Good evening. Thank you again for joining us as we have another Bible study on Feed Your Faith. Too many times people keep their mind on things that have to do with their doubts, and everything that would be there is just a concentration on what they have questions about. What we're trying to do with these series of studies is to point out the fact that the Bible does give us a foundation for faith. It causes that faith to be that which is growing more and more, and having it then become a life, a life led by trust in God and in his word that carries us on to do those things that God would have us to do. We've looked several times at this passage in Hebrews chapter 10. Last night looked at it again, where he points out, for you have need of endurance, that after having done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. That saving faith is a faith that obeys very clearly. Not only initially, as he talks about, but it perseveres, it goes onward, it keeps on doing all the way until receiving the promise. Some would suggest to us that we don't have to be those who do anything just as long as we mentally accept that Jesus is the Christ and say we receive him as our Savior. That that commitment in heart is all that needs to happen. But the fact is that commitment in heart needs to be followed up with an action that continues on, that has a life that comes from it, and that believes unto the saving of the soul, that keeps on with that all the way through our life. We had noted the fact that the Bible does teach salvation by faith. The Bible does not teach salvation by faith only. There's a difference. Faith is that which is at the undergirding of everything that we are to do. But that faith that is talked about is a living faith. It's a faith that acts in a way that's right with God. We pointed out the fact that over and over again, people will try to use scriptures in such a way as to negate that. Like Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10, where there the writer had said, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It doesn't take too much of an understanding of a context to show that there are works that are set in opposition. There's something that he talks about, they are not of yourselves, these works. That's not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, they have nothing to do with it. But then there are a kind of works where we are his workmanship created to do good works which God prepared beforehand. God is the originator of. He has demanded those things. And what should we do? That we should walk in them. So you've got works that have no part in our salvation and works that do have something to do with our foundation. Why? Because one has its origin as works of men of their merit, of their decision. But these are the works of God, the works that God afore prepared that we should walk in them. Those things we must do just as this passage declares. So to be fair with the context, we have to understand there is a distinction. Some would say that baptism is not an act of faith. In other words, it's not involved in the saving kind of faith. Well, let me suggest something. If it's not, then nobody should be baptized according to this context. Because it says, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So whatever work, we're not supposed to be doing that. My friend, if that's baptism, why is it that many in the denominational world practice baptism, but they say it has nothing to do with our salvation? If it doesn't, then no one should be baptized. They should be teaching against that. We also noted the case of Saul of Tarsus, later to become the Apostle Paul. Three 
chapters of the book of Acts tell us about his conversion. Many times there are those who make claims that Saul was saved on the Damascus road. I went to a Baptist seminary, as I pointed out, for my graduate work, and that's their idea, the, ba uh, the Damascus road conversion or the Damascus Road experience was something I heard about many times. And the concept that they had was that he was saved at that point of faith along the road to Damascus. We noted the fact that it wasn't going to be hard to show that that just isn't true according to the Bible. The fact is that Saul did believe in Jesus as Lord and said so. Who art thou, Lord, in verse 10 of Acts chapter 22? Verse 8, he didn't know who he was. Verse 9, Jesus told him. And verse 10, he believed. All of us accept that. But notice what happened. The timeline, Jesus came to him on that road. He believed there, and then he's told to go to Damascus. He does. Acts 9 says, three days passed. At that time, Ananias came to him. After three days, as Paul or Saul was a believer, Three days after that, that is when Ananias came, and what did he say? And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He was still, after three days, one who was in his sins. Can we be saved in our sins? No, that's what we are to be saved from, as we noted last night. Without that kind of faith, Without being a believer, we can't possibly be right with God. But is believing, is that what makes us forgiven of our sins? No, it's not. Very clearly here, he's still in his sins and told he needs to get rid of them. We noted the fact that he obeyed the same gospel that Jesus had taught. In Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's clearly the idea that is pointed out, that both of those are necessary. But in much of the denominational world, you hear a different doctrine, and that is salvation by faith only. That you believe you're saved, and later on, you can be baptized. And we ask the point, is there a difference? Well, yes, it's very obvious there's a difference. And what we need to recognize is that that difference is the difference between whether I see an act of God, baptism, as something that needs to be done. Ananias, when he came, said what? And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Who does that command come from? Was that Ananias' own idea? No, God in the flesh. Jesus told them, you go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Well, let's suppose, and some don't stop there. They say, well, no, I think Saul of Tarsus was saved by repenting and praying. Sometimes they'll say that's a part of faith. No, faith is accepting and trusting in God and then being willing to put that into action. But repentance and prayer many times are viewed as for instance, repenting, the altar call, to come down and call upon God to save us and give us that feeling of salvation, or the sinner's prayer that needs to be said, which you can never find in the Bible, by the way. But the idea is maybe it's that. Faith and this brings us to that point. Well, I know that's not right either, because in Acts chapter 9, Paul had been praying and repenting for three days. How do I know that? He was fasting for three days. What was fasting a sign of in the Old Testament? Fasting was clearly that which was commanded along with repentance. On the day of atonement was the commanded fast for Israel. It had to do with their sins. You see it repeatedly in the Old Testament that it was something they were repenting. They saw they had done wrong and their shame and humiliation because of sin was being seen in that way. Now, they were repenting, or Paul was repenting for three days because he was fasting for three days. But it also notes in Acts 9, you, Pete, or you Ananias, God told him, you go to Saul, 
and you'll find that he's praying. The word there is in the present tense. The idea when you come, he's praying because he's already praying and has been there praying. Well, if anything would bring one to be saved by faith, repentance, and prayer, then Saul of Tarsus should have been saved by that. But after having done that for three days, what happened? What happened is Ananias comes and says, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and what? Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He was still in his sins, despite being a believer, despite, despite repenting, despite the prayer that had been gone going for three days, he still was in his sins. So Paul's very clear point is, not yet is he saved. Some would say, well, maybe it was an appearance of Jesus. If Jesus appeared to you along the way, maybe Jesus took away his sin that way. I know that wasn't it either. Why? Well, because Jesus appeared to him back on the road to Damascus. It was at that point at which he was saved. Because why? Well, when Ananias comes to him, what does he say? You see, we're getting the same point. When Ananias came to him, he had already had the personal appearance of Jesus, but he was still in his sense. And that needed to be taken care of. So what we need to ask is, at what point was Saul saved? And I want to suggest to you, Saul was saved at the point of baptism. I don't need to wonder about that. We're going to take Paul's own words for it. He writes to the church at Rome. In Romans, the sixth chapter, in verses 1 through 11, notice what happens as you go through that context. He writes to those people and he says, we who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Now, what does that mean? We were baptized into Christ. Is there salvation outside of Jesus Christ? No. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 points that out very clearly. You must be in Christ to have that salvation. In none other name is there salvation but in the name of Jesus Christ, Peter and John say in Acts chapter 3. So when you look at all of that, I know I need to be in Christ. That's where salvation is. How do I get into him? I'm baptized into him. And when I'm baptized into him, I'm baptized into his death. What did Jesus shed in his death? He shed his blood. So what is the point? Paul very clearly is showing us, but that's not all. He goes on. He says, we were buried therefore with him. Now, what did Jesus do? He died and then he was buried. He wasn't buried before he was dead, but he was dead and then buried and then rose from the dead. Now, what's the point? In baptism, there's a like figure to that. What's the figure? Here is the man who is dead in sin. He's buried with Christ, meets his blood in his death, and he's raised to walk in a newness of life, as we're going to talk about. Here's the part. We were buried, therefore, with him. We're meeting of something of Jesus in that burial. And he says, we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. That's baptism. It's one of the reasons why we know that sprinkling is not acceptable for baptism. It has to do with an immersion. We're buried with him in baptism. Now what happens from that point? We're raised to walk in newness of life, Paul says. So the old man is done away, we've been dead, now we're buried, now we're raised to a new life, just as Christ was resurrected from the dead. What is baptism doing? It's appealing, it's a figure that looks to the point of our salvation, the blood of Jesus Christ. And that point of our salvation in the blood of Jesus Christ is reached when? When we're buried with him in the likeness of his death. So what happened? Christ became alive again. He was resurrected. That old man died, was buried. Jesus forgives us of our sins by his blood. And then what happens? We're raised to walk in a newness of life. What separated us from God and caused death? 
Romans had already covered that point. If we sin, the wages of sin is death. Now, when those sins are taken away, that's when we have that newness of life. Paul said that was in baptism. But then he said also, our old man was crucified with him. That old man of sin was crucified so that what? So that we should no longer, get this, be in bondage to sin. We're freed from sin. At what point? Paul very clearly is saying in Romans chapter 6, it's at the point of being in water baptism, immersed, buried with Christ, and raised to walk with him. Now in verse 11, he makes the point in a way of conclusion. Even so, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. So what happened? We were buried as those dead in sin. We're buried, we meet him in his death, his blood. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Now Paul said, that's what happened with me. Now, that's also what you need to reckon in yourself. Some of them might say, well, now wait a minute. How are you saying Paul is saying that about him? You see those pronouns that we put in blue? We who were baptized into Christ Jesus. We who were buried. We have become united. We were raised to walk in newness of life. What does we mean? Paul's not saying you you people at Rome experienced this. He said, we did. This was the same thing that happened with Paul. Paul is affirming that the point of his baptism is what changed him and them. That's why the we, just like it does us today. That's not difficult. If you ask Paul, Paul, when were you saved from your sins? Clearly, Paul would point out when I contacted the death of Christ and came into Christ. Now, what point made that clear? Romans chapter 6 did. Verses 3 through 11, that's the only conclusion I can make about that. And Saul, later called Paul, makes it very clear that that was the point at which he was forgiven. You know, sometimes we need to look at something and see is it essential or not. And the way that we do that is we point out the characteristics of something. If you ask me about what I see important about a car, I'm going to tell you mostly that it runs and gets me from here to there. And if somebody says, well, do you care a whole lot about the hubcaps? I've never cared about hubcaps too much. You can have them or not have them. It's not all that big a deal. Yeah, they may look good, but I'm not going to put that as essential with a car. Why? Because it can run without it. Now let's look at see at baptism. Could you do with or without it? It is, is it one of those optional things that you don't really need? Well, for one thing, we're told in Acts chapter 8 and verses 35 and 36, that this Ethiopian, when Jesus was preached to him, he asked a question, see, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Do you need to respond to the preaching of Christ? If so, and that response was in this first point, that what he asked, what hinders me to be baptized? Does that suggest something to you? The preaching of Jesus involved the preaching of baptism. Otherwise, how did he know about it if Jesus was preached and he asked about baptism? Those two are connected in some way. I know also in Acts chapter 8, as we talked about, it was the response of believers. When they believed Philip preaching good tidings concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. When they responded to the gospel message, that's how they responded in New Testament times. When we see in Matthew chapter 28, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, is it necessary to do things in the name of or by the authority of the Father, Son, and Spirit? Well, that's deity. Deity. 
That's the Godhead. If the full Godhead's authority is behind baptism, why would I conclude it's optional or that it just isn't important with regard to salvation? The Godhead's purpose in all of the gospel was to bring men back to God, to free them from sin. And the authority of what? The authority of baptism is behind that. Does it have something to do with salvation or not? When you look at Matthew 28 and verse 19 as well, you notice that go make disciples of all nations. To be disciples of Christ. That's the point Jesus meant. Go make my disciples of all the nations by baptizing them. When did I become a disciple or a follower of Christ? This passage says, and Jesus is the one speaking himself just before his ascension, it was Jesus Christ who was saying that. In Mark 16 and verse 16, the 15 starting now, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe will be condemned. Sometimes I hear people say, well, it doesn't say that if you're not baptized, you won't be condemned. Remember what we talked about? When that Ethiopian eunuch, a man who was a treasurer, asked Philip along the way, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? What did Philip say to him? If you believe, you may. In other words, you must believe before you can be baptized. So if one is not going to believe first, then clearly he's not going to be baptized either. You see the point? He doesn't have to say that. But I'm not interested in how to be lost. I'm interested in how to be saved. And what does Jesus say? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Can I say it's unimportant when Jesus connected it with salvation? Can I say it's unimportant if I read 1 Peter 3, 21, the light figure whereunto baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the appeal for a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of the dead. What am I doing in baptism? I'm that man dead in sin, to be buried in baptism with Christ to meet his death or his blood, trusting in God to raise me forth in the newness of life. That's the point that Peter is making. Whereunto the light figure does also now save us. What light figure? Baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of flesh has nothing to do with the water. Sometimes accused of some people say, you believe that water is holy and what's right? No, there's nothing holy about the water. There's something holy about the God who commanded baptism. And when I'm told by him that it's a light figure of this one calling unto God for salvation, I'm appealing to God in the very act of baptism to save me having been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. So simple. When you look at the fact that Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And I look at Acts 22 verse 16, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I look at Romans 3 and see it's connected with his death or blood to be raised to walk in a new life. The body of sin is done away there. We're made alive unto God in Christ. We put on Christ there, Galatians 3.27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. We're told in Galatians 3.27 also, not only does it put us into Christ, but we put him on at that point. In other words, the salvation that he gives. When I see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 that they were baptized as many as were be being obedient to the word, the fact is they were added to the church daily. I know the one church I read about in the New Testament is what one is added into by God when he's baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's being baptized into the one body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 
It's when one gets into the kingdom, as Jesus had talked about it being the birth of water. And the only thing you see about that in the New Testament is water baptism. And then in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it is like circumcision. How? You put off the body of the flesh in a circumcision of the heart. The idea is those sins being taken away. Why? Because there's been an exercise of that old man cutting him away. And now I knew in Christ forgiven of sins in him. Now, when you look at all of that is what's said about baptism in the New Testament, how can I conclude that it's optional? How can I say it really isn't involved in our salvation? And remember, if I do so conclude that, that it has nothing to do with our salvation and that it's a work of man, the passage that many of my friends who believe this doctrine of faith only turn to in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. If it isn't anything that has to do with salvation, then I need to be avoiding it. Why is it that we can miss these simple passages and what their point is? You see the idea? When I talk about a living faith, does that living faith involve baptism? What the Hebrew writer says, I need to endure doing those things that God has said, living by faith and being one who is obedient to Christ. Surely we recognize that. And do we see that Ephesians chapter two and verse 10, while it excludes works of men, it says we were made to be in Christ by the works of God. Be his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ask yourself a question, my friend. It's very simple. Who was the inventor of baptism? Who originated it? Who was the one that commanded it? And what you'll find out is it was Jesus Christ. Now, is Jesus Christ merely man or is Jesus Christ divine? When you answer that question, you answer it very easily. John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you miss it there, down in verse 14 and verse 17, he's identified as Jesus Christ, that way of truth and life. There's no doubt about it. We need to live by faith. And to feed our faith, we need to start out by being one who's baptized into Christ because that's what Jesus said. And because we're showing forth his death and appealing to him and his blood to forgive us of our sin. Thank you so much for watching again. We'll come back on Monday night, the Lord willing, and have another lesson on uh, this uh, Feed Your Faith and hopefully we'll go throughout next week. There'll be some changes after that as we're allowed to come back and worship on Sundays. But we're going to try to determine how to do that and uh, exactly what the schedule going forth from that time is. But for at least this next week, we're hoping and praying that we'll be able to be with you each night for a study again, Monday through Friday. May God bless you. Good night.